This Thank conference you, will now be recorded. It is a blessing and a privilege to be able to do this and share this with you this morning. I never take this for, for granted. This morning we are going to talk about the importance of sharing our information of God and the experiences of God to other people, no more so than our children. And uh, so why, why am I doing this? Because in our readings we've been going through the Proverbs. And you will see in the Proverbs it's the writings of such a, are a communication between a father and a son. And this is why I'm, I'm, I'm doing this and this is why I want to, want to share. I've been inspired by these writings. Solomon says, you know, listen, my son, listen to my words of instruction. He says, a wise son will listen to my instruction. He also says, a fool is just a burden to his father. Um, so it's a very common occurrence in Proverbs about this father-son connection, passing on wisdom. So it's about the dads to start with. Dads. Dads have a real reputation, don't they? Don't they? they um, one of the things that popped into my mind is dad jokes. We know, we, we know all about them. We've been graced by them multiple times. And I, I just really don't know about it because before you're a dad, as a male, a male can share a sophisticated, well-constructed, very current, very funny joke. And then after they become a dad, the jokes just turn to cheese. So I don't, I'm still unsure about what's happening and how that occurs. It's just a, one of life's mysteries. Dads also have reputation for being the fun parent. And that's much to the annoyance of the mum. Isn't it? It's the thing, isn't it? Dads are the fun guy sometimes. And uh, amongst all these jokes and the fun that dads have, there's also something else that dads are known for. Passing on words of wisdom. It's a thing. You do hear about, my dad used to say. There is something about a dad, or that mentality, that he wants to share. And perhaps this line, this word of wisdom, will be passed on through the generations. Perhaps there's a little bit of pride in that, can't deny that, but there is something in the male psyche that wants to share wisdom. So I thought I would, uh, we would start with your dads. I've taken the liberty of asking some of you about the words of wisdom that your dads shared and the things that have stuck in your mind from your upbringing and your experience with your dad. Now, before I get into it, um, I've got about 10 or so responses. So we're going to be graced with wisdoms from dads. That's great. But a few people responded to me um, and said, oh, that's tricky. Don't know if my dad said much. Don't know if my dad had much wisdom to offer. And there were some responses saying, well, my dad was more of an action man. You know, I, I looked at his example more than um, the words that he spoke to me. And I can relate to that because my dad's like that, right? So I understand that. So some of you couldn't actually respond with a line that your dad said. But anyway, we've got plenty of lines that other dads have said that help to fill the gaps. Some dads just love this stuff, right? So I'm going to start with David Luxmore. And if you've ever been holidaying with David Luxmore, he will say, you always feel better after a swim. He will count the amount of swims he has every day and he will make sure the whole family knows how many swims he's up to. Now, thank you, Josie, for that. But I asked David about his dad and he came back with a statement that his dad said on his wedding day and I simply cannot put it on this platform. But he did say, he did mention a lovely line from his granddad. And so this is from David Luxmore's granddad. Before you buy something, have a think about whether or not you can make it instead. Mm. 
Very good from David Screenhead. Here's one from Lemuel Brinkman. Have a look at this one. Have faith in God. Powerful. What mountains can be moved if we have faith? Thank you, Lem, for those words. Derek Nightingale, he had some words of wisdom. People don't care how much you know, but know how much you care. Derek had a few. This one came from Phil, but Sharon remembered her dad saying, pull the weeds out when they're small. All right, there's more meanings than one in that, isn't there? It's not just about gardening. Very profound from Derek. Dirk Prins, he's been quoted. There is no such word as can't. How valuable is that from Dirk? I asked Robert, and Robert ex explained one other one that he'd heard from his granddad this time. If you drown in the creek, I'll give you the biggest hiding you'll ever have. And none of his children ever drowned in the creek that went through their property because of these words of wisdom. How valuable. Phil saw the law of kindness. When you need to talk to someone in a conflict situation, always take a chocolate cake. And Phil is known for baking chocolate cakes and taking them to situations where there could potentially be some conflict. And now he was a teacher. So there was particular times between teacher and, and parents that he would provide a chocolate cake for. And of course, he brought this idea into the meetings as well. So there was chocolate cakes. And isn't it amazing to know that, to think that Phil Thor was known for baking chocolate cakes because of this reason, because no one can deny a chocolate cake. Ken Franklin, be early to every ecclesial activity. Be at every ecclesial activity. From, uh, from Ken Franklin. Right, this one. The issue is never the issue from Gordon Mudge. And he continues. There's his version of what happened and her version of what happened. The truth always lies in between those points. Something is only worth what someone else is prepared to pay for it. Mm. We tend to look for God's hand in the big events of life, but we should look for God's hand working in all aspects of our life. And he continues. An exhort is like a bicycle tire. The longer the spoke, the greater the tire. So, in part, it's Gordon's fault that this exhort is going to be long because he had so much to share. And more? <laughs> no, not this time. We'll move on from, from Gordon. Thank you so much, Gordon. Thank you, dads, for, their words of, for those words of wisdom that have been successfully passed down and shared amongst your children and now much for further abroad. Your legacy continues. Fathers, Proverbs, um, Solomon, what's he, what's he getting at here? What's the purpose of, of, of Proverbs? We can actually see that in the very first uh, part of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1. Solomon actually says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, um, and he, in verse 4, he goes on to say, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. So Solomon here is really focusing on the simple and the youth. What's the purpose of these proverbs? To inform the youth. And so how is Solomon going to start informing the youth? And so this is how he actually starts. First thing he talks to his son about is, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, 
and forsake not your mother's teaching. I'm just going to stop right there because the bulk of Proverbs is about the dad. But the very first time he brings up the dad, he mentions the mum. This is important because I believe in an ever-increasing way, every time I see father written in terms of what fathers must do, I see mother in it now. I see father now as a representation of a, of a father-mother unit working together to bring up their kids. Solomon is telling us this there. They are a unit. They are a team, mum and dad. They are one, and they are working together for other kids' benefit. Their instruction and their teaching, Solomon describes, as a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. That's what the teaching and the instruction of your mum and dad are worth to you. Interesting, we heard about the garland last week when David mentioned the name meaning of Stephen. The garland or the wreath or the crown, as it's sometimes translated as, is a symbol of honour. And the pendants around your neck, and the first time this Hebrew word appears is in relation to a decked out camel, camel in, in um, Judges. So I've got the picture of the camel there. What we're saying here is Solomon's father's instruction and your mother's teaching are, are honour and beauty to you. But he goes on, because in Proverbs chapter 6, your father's commandment and your mother's teaching, bind them on your heart, tie them around your neck. This is how important they are. And we're going to look at verse 22 later. Jumping down to verse 23, the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light. Your mum and dad's commandment and teaching are lights to you. I find that interesting. God is light. God created light he dwells in unapproachable light jesus said i am the light of the world the word in psalms is the light to our path your mum and dad's teaching is light to you there's a little verse in proverbs 20 which is quite interesting any light that you ever gain from your parents or from anyone that you are showing to anyone is completely abolished and lost in a moment, the moment you curse your mum and dad. Talk about the source of light. Don't curse your mum and dad. So the purpose of this exhort really is about sharing to the next generation, sharing to other people, um, and not so much about the actual um, advice that's given. But having said that, we still want to ask the question, um, how can we make this wisdom stick to our kids? How do we actually do it? And so Proverbs do, does have some wonderful tactics and tips that we can use. And the, the repeated thing in Proverbs is, hear my son, accept my words, be attentive, listen to me, incline your ears, and it's repeated right throughout. This is Solomon sitting his sons down, getting undivided attention from them and saying, you need to listen. So this is not you driving in the car with the radio on, the kids in the back doing their own thing and thinking, oh, kids, I've got some advice for you. This is pulling over, turning the radio off, getting them to stop what they're doing and say, listen, I've got something to share. If comes up quite a bit in Proverbs, Brother Robert brought this up um, on Proverbs chapter 2 when he spoke recently. If, if you do this, if you do this, then you will understand the fear of God. Cause and effect. You are using your experience to teach the children. Do that and then that will happen. So that's an important tactic that Solomon uses. Do not. Now, I always thought do not was no good. I've heard from other sources that do not, constant do nots to children is no good. Solomon uses do not. So we're going to take it because this is the wisdom from God. And they're great good. They're great to do nots. Don't forget my teaching. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. The, the next two are similar. Be not wise in your own eyes. 
Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. There are some great do nots. I think we need to balance the do nots in amongst the ifs and the listens. And the other thing, just one other thing I've discovered in Proverbs is repetition over and over again. We're getting the same thing, same message. How many times do we hear about that deceitful woman? A lot. But lots of other repetitions in Proverbs. So there's just some tips about how we make this wisdom stick. Um, obviously, our fathers who said these lines used some of these tips, you know, to make them stick. The reason why you were able to recite them, bring them back. So, aside from the mum and dad and, and the way he started Proverbs, what actually is the first thing Solomon, um, in terms of advice, gives to his son? And this is what he says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. This is the first thing. Solomon comes up with to give to his son. I was looking at that and I was like, I wonder what's going on there. And then I thought about Psalms. And I thought about the very first Psalm, David's work. What does that say? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners. David's first bit of advice, words of wisdom. So it's not like I've brought up something here that is like an exact copy, but they sound similar, don't they? Both men here are saying you've got to recognize the sinners and just stay away. They will influence you. It will be problematic, especially if you're young and you don't have the, the methods and the ways of controlling sin, let alone being in the company of sinners. And that's challenging whether you're young or not. They sound kind of similar, but my point here is, is that David is Solomon's dad. And if David had much to do with his son in terms of sharing words of wisdom, this was probably something he repeated quite a few times as uh, something he should do. And Solomon came up with it in the very first instance when it comes to sharing his wisdom. Did David spend a lot of time with Solomon? teaching him words of wisdom. Well, we know that he did because of this. In Proverbs 4, Solomon says, when I was a young, when I was a son with my father, tender, the only one on the side of my mother, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live. Most definitely, David invested time in his son in terms of giving him words of wisdom. Now, if David's last words to Solomon are anything to go by, they were really good words. And these, these are David's last words. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God. Walk in his ways, his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do wherever you turn. Wonderful words from David, departing words um, there. So we can assume that David um, offered a lot to Solomon. Um, he, he, he really set up his son beautifully, didn't he, for the job that his son had to do. He recognized that and gave a lot for it. Solomon really pushes the idea that it's important to share to your sons. And so does he only get this from the example of his dad? Because his dad clearly did, so he's doing it. Well, his dad says you've got to look at the law of Moses. And so my question is, is in the law of Moses any information about sharing to the youth? Did Solomon go into the law of Moses at all and find any good tips and tricks and instruction about sharing to your kids? And the answer is absolutely the law of Moses is full of it. So much so that it's a dominant feature in my mind, but here's a real great one. And these words that I command you today 
what were those words? That you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul and mind. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. That's all day, every day, talking to your kids about God. That's the advice there from Moses in Deuteronomy 6. Now, six times, actually, before the end of chapter 11, Moses has mentioned, talk to your kids. So there's something going on. Solomon was inspired indeed, and this is the verse that we've already brought up before, about your father's commandments and teaching. He says, bind them on your heart and tie them round your neck, and they will walk. When you walk, they'll lead you. When you lie down, they'll watch over you. And when you're awake, it's the same thing. He's heard it in the law of Moses, and he's expressing it now to his children. Here's a great one. What's the value and the absolute power of this process passing on to your kids? We, we can see in today's age a negative um, sense of this passing on information to your kids in a very powerful way. When you see footage of, let's say, young Palestinian children hating on the Jewish people, these are young children who have no ability to make good decisions and able to reason why they hate the Israelites. They don't know the situation themselves, and you know they've just been taught by their parents to hate, and this process continues from generation to generation, breeding more and more hate. This is a negative effect, but very powerful, isn't it? It creates a nation that hates, and we've seen that, obviously, this is a process that's all over the world. So here's a positive view on this tape, on this, on this phenomenon and how it could save your life and create purpose and, and glorify God. So the very first statement there in Moses and Jesus in chapter 4 says, See, I have taught you statutes and, statutes and rules as my Lord, the God, my God, Father, um, commanded me. So straight away off the bat, we actually have a process. We have the Father commanding Moses. We have Moses now teaching the Israelites the statutes. So straight away, there is this passing on of information. But what comes next? That you should do them in the land. What's that? The commandments. Keep them, do them, for they will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. What peoples? The surrounding peoples. When they hear of these statutes, they will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that there, that there is a God so near as the Lord our God is to us? So what Moses is saying there is he's talking about a hypothetical situation where the nation of Israel, as they've been called, are glorifying God in the exact purpose that he had for them. This is how it was supposed to work and how God has designed the process of calling these Israelites. This is what he wants. And how is it supposed to happen? Following the commandments. Could be problematic, though, because Moses goes on, only take care, keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen. What's he talking about there? These experiences that you've had with God, don't forget them. If you forget them, this will be problematic. How do we fix the problem? Make them known to your kids and your kids' kids. We have this process. The father has spoken to Moses. Moses is talking to Israel, and Israel is, is directed to tell their kids and their kids' kids. Um, yeah, they're right, Gen 2, Gen 3, that's the one. So we have this hypothetical situation where they're glorifying God as a nation, where other people are looking in going, wow, these are a wise and understanding people and they have an amazing God. It's bookended by sharing information. At the start and at the end, 
we have a successful sharing of what we know of God to the next generation. It's built on following God's commandments and sharing God's commandments, this whole process. So my question is, was there ever a time in Israel's history when this was realized? A wise and understanding people. I'm going to say yes, and it was the time of Solomon, the wise and understanding king. And we know that, that God was glorified in this period of history because we've got the Queen of Sheba who, I don't know how far away she was, but somehow she heard about this wise king and the great God, and she traveled all the way to hear and to see for herself. So this is a realization of that exact situation where everything has worked beautifully. It's worked well, this process. What's the process? David talks to Solomon, and then Solomon talks to his kids. It's really all about David talking to Solomon initially, isn't it? David invested heavily in his son because of, the, because of what he had to do as a king. And the result was that. He produced this um, realization of what God promised would happen if you just obey my commandments and you share it to your kids. So it's really, really powerful in my, in my mind. And it shows the power of this phenomenon of passing to your kids. So you remember this um, slide? about tips and tricks from the Proverbs about how we make this information stick to our kids. Well, there's actually a little bit in the Law of Moses. There's a lot in the Law of Moses, and I could say God as well. Just a few that I picked up on. Signs. Because it comes from Exodus. After God had done many plagues and uh, signs in the land of Egypt, he says that you tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt with these Egyptians, and then they'll know that I'm God. So it's signs, it's sharing the hand of God with your kids, the, 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 the things that you have seen and experienced with them. I think God is saying that's important. Traditions, believe it or not. See, after God introduced the Passover, he said, and when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You will say this. He tells them what to say. When the kids go, why are we doing the Passover? Why are we killing the lamb? Why are we eating that bread? Tell you what, if your kids ever say to you, why do we share this wine? Why do we break bread? Then you just lean on in and go, well, I'm so glad you asked. Because that is a tradition that we do every single week. That is what I'm calling a trigger. Not only for us in our own minds and, and remembrance, but for our kids too. Why are we doing this, Dad? Why do we break bread, Mum? So traditions, believe it or not, are very useful triggers for teaching our kids. Prayers around the table, family prayers, certain things that we might do at home, kids will go, why do we actually do it? And then there was that one that we've sort of talked about, just share God all day, every day, and that was that Deuteronomy one that Moses was kind of um, pushing. So where to from now? I only got a couple more slides and then we're done. Abraham. See now what I can do, we can do is we can keep going back looking at fathers until we run out of fathers. And we keep we can keep looking at this process and see him seeing if it's been successful through the generations. And we can see that yes, from Abraham to Moses, this process of sharing to your kids was successful. And we can see from Moses to David, this process was successful. So my question is, with this name written up there on the screen, why did God choose Abraham? Why do you think God chose him? Out of all the people in the world, God wanted to find someone that would be the very beginning of a chosen nation that God would call out for his purpose for his name to glorify him. The beginning of God's family for God's name. Abraham starts this process. God chooses him. Why? Is it because of faith? Well, we know he was very faithful. 
Is it because God chose him because he had such great obedience? Is it because he had really good leadership? Well, here it is. Here's why God chose Abraham. Thing that Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, then all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This is God's purpose. I have chosen him that he will command his kids and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. That's amazing to me. Out of all the reasons you would choose a man, God chose him because he's going to talk to his kids. This is how God started his family, his special family. He started well, is what we're suggesting here, isn't it? And the word chosen, by the way, is actually probably better rendered known. And I think that's even more profound because God knew that he would talk to his kids. He knew that that's what the type, he was a family man. He was a friendly man and he would talk to his kids. He knew it. And so that's how he started his family with this man. And so we know that God wants this process to be repeated over and over and over again. So we need to jump forward now. Last slide. We need to consider perhaps a time when there was a problem, when this process had stopped at some point and there was darkness in the land. It was the time around Luke 1. When I darkness, I mean by the knowledge of God, the, the leaders of the religious, um, or should I say the, the, the Jewish leaders, the teachers of the law, had really lost the way and were not fulfilling this process of sharing very well at all. So something needed to be done and God needed to step in. And so the first thing that he decided to do is send a baby. And this baby was John the Baptist. I'm going to start with this little guy, and he will, have, will give joy and gladness when he's born. What else is he going to do? He's going to be great before the Lord. He is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And to the wonder of his parents, this is what John is going to be able to do. He's going to turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Wow. There's a big turnaround happening. We need another man to start this process again. And he's going to turn not just a few, but many people of Israel back to God. And so my question is, how is he going to do it? What's going to be his process? In the spirit and power of Elijah, John the Baptist is going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. I love that. I think that's amazing. You want to fix the problem? You want to restore light back into the system? You want to re-engage the phenomenon um, of sharing and sharing and, and the value of that and the results of that? You've got to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. That's how we fix this problem. And uh, this is a direct quote, you know, from Malachi, isn't it? And it's a, it's a future quote talking about the work of Elijah. And Elijah's going to come and prepare the people for Jesus. And Elijah is going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. And it says in Malachi that the kids' hearts will be turned back to the fathers. This connection, this father-children connection, and mother, remember, has to happen again in order for all things to be restored. <laughs> I just think it's really, really amazing and shows the power of this uh, request that God has for us that we share to our kids. So we're going to now um, share some emblems, um, and we're going to remember that we are saved because of a wonderful father-son relationship um, between God and his father, where God invested fully in his son so that Jesus could do what he did for us. 